This is Indianapolis coach, Reggie Wayne, and you're listening to the For the Culture podcast. This is the For the Culture podcast. I'm your host, Luke Diamond, and joining me today on the show, we have one of the all-time great Indianapolis Colts, all-pro Super Bowl champion, and the Colts' all-time leader in sacks, the great Robert Mathis. Rob, appreciate you joining us today here on the For the Culture podcast. Thanks for having me, man. Uh, Beautiful day, and uh, it's a good day to talk some football. No doubt. We're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to talk football. We're going to take a trip down memory lane. But before we get into all that good stuff, Rob, how are you and your family right now during this crisis, during this pandemic of COVID-19? We're we're quarantining, (laughs) whatever whatever that means. So we're just staying safe, staying out the way, and uh, everything is, 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 is okay right now. Yep, and that's all you could do. So God bless you and your family. I'm glad everybody's happy and healthy during these crazy times of COVID-19. What are you doing to pass time in quarantine? Oh, uh, just trying to catch up on, on the little things, trying to stay away from TV so much. And just if there's a little y'all work needs to be done, we do it. Reading and, you know, I'm also looking at pass rush. <laughs> of course. So of when, course. It's, when it's time to hit the ground running, I, we'll be ready. Oh, I believe that. I know you guys will be ready. And that's good. It's important to stay productive, stay active, continuing to watch film, being able to get outside, do yard work, especially now with the warm weather coming, being able to get outside is huge because if it was 20 degrees, we'd be stuck inside all day long. And then this would be a hundred times worse than it already is. But on a positive note, Rob, this off season, you were inducted into the HBCU Historical Black College Football Hall of Fame, class of 2020. What a tremendous honor that must have been for you. Congratulations. And what was that overall experience like? And how does it feel to be among such prestigious company? Yeah, it was a it was a tremendous honor because a lot of those guys that was there, I mean, you just kind of grew up idolizing as a child. Just uh, the Doug Williams, well, Michael Strahan, he wasn't there, but he's he's part of it. Uh, just to know, uh, Walter Payton, John Stallworth, he he went to a fellow Alabama and them alum, and just just the love that's shown and just earning a seat at the table was was quite quite an honor. Jeez, man, as you go through these names, the elite company you're now amongst in the HBCU Football Hall of Fame. Congratulations once again. And what was it like for you to be inducted in your hometown of Atlanta, Georgia, where you were born and raised? Oh, uh, that was the cherry on top because, uh, like you said, I'm from born and raised Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, football in the South in general it, it it means a lot. It's it's very heavy, and so just being there, just being amongst family and friends, it was it was truly special. Off the top of your head, do you have any coaches or mentors from Alabama A and M who helped you get to the point where you could look back and say, "I was an HBCU football Hall of Famer"? Oh, sh- uh, yes. Off the top, uh, my D line coach Thomas Rock Rogerman. He was, uh, you know, he's uh, he's passed away now, but he 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 got the best out of me, and uh, he 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 he's the guy that told me to take pride in your stats, you know, and just do what got you here. And that guy, he was every day he demanded excellence, and he wouldn't ask anybody that wasn't capable of giving it to give it. So he was a Thomas Rock Rogerman, he was the, I, I, I give him the best D-line coach ever in history. Uh, he was one B, one uh, A was John Tierlink, my D-line coach, <laughs> my rookie year with the Colts. <laughs> we're going to get to Tierlink in a minute as we're talking to the Colts' all-time leader in sacks, Robert Mathis here on the For the Culture podcast. And Rob, after you have that incredible career at Alabama A&M, you enter the 2003 draft. What was draft night like for you? And did you know going into the draft – that the Colts had an eye on you and the Colts would ultimately be the team that drafts you in 2003? I had no clue because um, I know when I got drafted, it was fifth round, but to me it felt like the first round. So I didn't – I just wanted an opportunity. I just, just just realized my dream. But I had family, friends. We were staying in a two-bedroom apartment on the south side of Atlanta. And ironically, a lot of teams were calling and I don't know why they do this. They kind of play with your emotions. Mm-hmm. They call you and they say, we're going to take you with our next pick. Stay ready. They pick, as the pick comes up and they take somebody else. So you're just sitting there stewing, just pissed off and all this. And now I get a call from the coach. It was uh, Bill Polian. So by this point, I'm already a little upset. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I'm thinking it's another, okay, you're just going to play around with my emotions. And so 
He's like, am I ready to be a coach? I'm like, yes, sir. So, I mean, I'll wait till my name runs across this ticker until I believe it. And then he puts Coach Dungey on the phone. He says, are you ready to be a coach? We've been watching you. We want, we're going to take you. I'm like, yes, sir. I'm ready. I'm ready when you guys are. <laughs> And the next day, you know, my name runs across the ticker, and literally the whole apartment, all my family, we just we just hit the roof, celebrating, laughing, crying, doing happy dances, and, and all this stuff. And uh, it was just a a moment that you'll never forget. Wow, that is a great story and a life altering story because you get drafted by the Colts, you play your entire career for the Colts, and you still work for the Colts. Till this day, in player development, you're raising your family in Indiana. So that was really a life-changing moment for you, getting drafted by the Indianapolis Colts in the fifth round of the 2003 draft. And staying in 2003, when you first arrived in Indianapolis, what was your first impression of the city like? And what was your first impression of the Colts organization like? It's something that you would never even think. The first time I got to Indianapolis, the first thing I noticed were people riding riding around the city on motorcycles with no helmets. That was like, I've never seen that in my life. <laughs> I've never seen that. <laughs> and uh, I was like, whoa, this is kind of like a, a brand new world here. Because in the South, this you you have a helmet. Put a helmet on, and, and that's just what it is. So to get up here, it's a different environment. But at the same time, it's a big little town. I mean, a big city with a small town feel because, you know, they, they just embrace me. Uh, the city embraced me, and from 2003, just kind of, I became a Hoosier. Still trying to figure out what a Hoosier is, but I'm happy to say that I am one now. <laughs> <laughs> I think a Hoosier's just a resident or a native from Indiana. So, after 17 years and being one of the greatest Colts of all time, I am sure you could call yourself a Hoosier at this point, Rob. One of the all-time great Indianapolis Colts. Robert Mathis joining us here on the For the Culture podcast. And Rob, I had Boom Heron on like a year or two ago, and he said what he loved so much about Indianapolis, and you kind of just alluded to the same thing. When he first arrived, he said it wasn't too fast, but it wasn't too slow. It was the perfect happy medium for a young player where you're not going to get into too much trouble, but at the same time, you could still have a little bit of fun without being totally bored in the city. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it was it's big enough to stand up with all the other major cities and to host two or three major sports. And uh, but it's small enough that you can just you don't have to deal with as much traffic. <laughs> yeah, and I would love a little bit of that in my life because I live right outside New York City and I work in New York City, and the traffic is an absolute nightmare. But Rob, when you got to Indianapolis, we talk about the 2003 draft. You come to Indy. It's not too big. It's not too small. Was there a vet? your rookie season that took you under their wing and kind of groomed you as a young player, showing you the ropes and what it meant to be a professional football player. Yeah. I would say, uh, Chad Bratsky was very instrumental. He was a DN. So he had initially started his career with the giants. He played with straight hand mm -hmm. and, um, uh, the tail end of his career, he was with the Colts. He gave me a lot of good advice, like on and off the field, like name and off the field. It's like, okay, never, never go cheap on a bed because that's what you're going to be sleeping, that, you know, rest and how important rest was. I mean, stuff like that, it really went a long way with me because it was it was real. And on the field, he taught me how to self-scout, you know, things to look at, just how to attack an opponent. What do I, things that preach not read, stuff, you know, just things like that. And uh, he was very, very key in my growth as early as an early player. Rob, when you take a look at the great duos in NFL history, you can't talk about pass rushers without talking about Dwight Freeney and Robert Mathis. Robert Mathis and Dwight Freeney. You guys were one of the greatest, arguably the greatest pass rushing duo in NFL history. Did it make your job easier, Dwight already being in Indy for a season, being an 0-2 pick when you arrived, and vice versa? How did you make his job easier when arriving in Indianapolis in 03? It wasn't easy at all. I don't know what you're talking about. That man <laughs> had 13 sacks coming through the door, so the expectation for me was, was pretty lofty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and, you know, just because we're the same, we're the same exact height. We're both six feet, but he's a, he's a little, he, he weighs a little more than that. Maybe had 15, 20 pounds on me, but he was a, he was a, a man. <laughs> he was, he was a grown man. And me coming in my rookie year saying that, okay, we want you to be op the opposite him. I like, okay, I could be that player, but saying and doing is two different things. But uh, 
we fed off each other. I, always, I tell everybody, I'm his biggest cheerleader, and he was mine. We talked. We always talked and schemed how to get to the quarterback. That was the that was the most common denominator of every one of our conversations because it was truly quarterback hating was a religion with us. <laughs> so, and we always joke about which one of us stole the most sacks from the other guy because I truly believe the white would have uh, north of 175 sacks if I didn't steal a couple from him and, and, and vice versa. So it's always a nice running joke, but we still talk at least once a week, just like, 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 like we never left. Wow. I love to hear stuff like that. I mean, that's just awesome. Two guys I grew up idolizing still talk on a weekly basis. You guys haven't played together in what, seven, eight years now since 2012. And you're still talking on a weekly basis. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it was truly an honor playing with him. We we learned we we pretty much grew up in this in this professional NFL game together. Uh, learned a lot. We uh, we we stole moves from each other. I that spin move, I, I shit, I stole it from him. He taught me how to do it, and also like the speed, like dip move. Um, he learned that from me. So it's a lot of stuff. We just fed off each other, and just I I, I felt like we revolutionized as a duo how how teams block guys that ha- that has two or more guys. No question. As we're talking to the Colts' all-time leader in sacks, the great Robert Mathis here on the For the Culture podcast, talking about how Freeney and Mathis revolutionized the position, and Freeney brought that spin move to the NFL because if you go back to the early 2000s, six-foot guys were considered too small to play the position. You guys brought a speed element that totally changed the position where now you look at a six-foot guy and he's not undersized anymore because he has the speed to make up for what he might lack in quote unquote prototypical size. I mean, the common thing was, oh, we're, we were undersized, but now it's more, you're too big. The game is speed. So you never want to compromise speed for size. And so, like I said, I do like to think we had a little part in, in that. And so it's good to see where the game is. Just, uh, it's about getting it done. It's about putting it on, on the field versus looking good on paper. Oh, yeah, there's no question. And I always ask myself when I talk about a great player, did this guy help transcend his position or help transcend his sport? And not only do you and Dwight each have over 120 career sacks, you guys each had great statistical careers, all pros, pro balls, Super Bowl championship, but you guys also helped transcend your position and help transcend your sport at the same time, which you deserve a ton of credit for. And before you mention Coach Tierlink, your defensive line coach, when you broke into the league, let's dive in a little bit deeper to Coach Tierlink and the impact he had on your legendary career. It was his job to scheme your best attributes. What you do best, they're, they're scheme around it. So that what makes a coach a coach. It's not about the scheme, it's about the skill. And he taught us the skill and the importance of having that skill so you can play in any scheme. But he made sure Dwight and myself, okay, we were two quote-unquote undersized guys, so he's just going to put us in position to thrive. And uh, the whole defense pretty much was, you can consider undersized, it was a speed defense. But it was their job to get us in the best position to succeed, and that's what they did. And he was he was, he spearheaded that with the D-line, with the unit that, that uh, we played with. And he just told us, whatever you do best, do it. And let us worry about the, the, the schematic X's and O's. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked out pretty well for you guys. Rob, you always seem to get better throughout the course of your career. How did you make that happen between specific workout regimens and your overall work ethic? Because you see a lot of young players, they break into the league, they peak early, but you just got better and better as the years went on throughout the course of your NFL career. Well, I would always say that was the one thing that I, I, I tried to always stay top of the uh, top of the heat was work ethic. I didn't I would not let anybody outwork me. I don't care if it if it killed me. But um uh, it was more so whatever player has, you ha- you have whatever motivation that you have, internalize it. And with me it was always the word I'm too. The T O O. And people always say you were too this, too that, you know, too that and too this. And I just used it and just to prove just to prove people wrong. I know it's a cliche. A lot of a lot of athletes use this, but it was like like for real. It's like I would tell people, okay, I play defensive end, whether it's high school, 
college or pros. I tell people what I play, they look at, they give me that up down look like you're too little to be doing this. I said, okay, well, it's it's about the size of the, the the fighting the dog versus the size of the dog in the fight. So that was pretty much my motivation just to prove people wrong. We're talking to the Colts' all-time leader in sacks, the great Robert Mathis here on the For the Culture podcast. Rob, you play most of your career, most of your life in a 4-3 defense. You have damn near 100 sacks in a 4-3. We switch over to a 3-4 in 2012, and in 2013 you rack up 19 and a half sacks. You're a first-team All-Pro. What defense did you think you were better in, and which defense did you feel more comfortable in, the 3-4 or the 4-3? So from high school, college, and pros, it was always a four three, you know, hand in the dirt, just just go go get it. That particular year, two thousand thirteen, was special because I had a year pretty much to learn and and get adjusted. So the two thousand twelve season was me trying to learn what the heck I was doing, standing up, and what am I what am I looking at? How do I play this? My attack angles. And so twenty thirteen was, I guess, the perfect storm. Because they pretty much gave me the keys. That was the first year uh, Dwight was uh, not my running mate, so they just told me to look, just just go, go get go get that guy, the guy with the court, the guy with the football, go get him. And I said, okay, <laughs> I can do that. Yeah, but that's what you did best in both defenses: the three, four, the four, three, 123 career sacks in the two schemes combined. So just an incredible, incredible career. And they've been playing, while everybody's stuck in quarantine, classic games on ESPN and NFL Network over the last couple of weeks. They just played the fourth and two game from 2009 a couple of days ago on either ESPN or NFL Network when Melvin Bullock came up on fourth and two, made the incredible tackle, got the stop, gave Reggie and Manning the short field for the game-winning touchdown. Just a great game. And there were so many great games that you guys had in the 2000s. But think it back to the two big ones, beating the Patriots in 06 in the AFC Championship game and beating the Chicago Bears in Super Bowl 41. Let's take a little trip down memory lane in those two games, those two classic games that brought the Colts the only Super Bowl since moving to Indianapolis back in 1983. The funny thing is that those two games were probably the, the most important two games in Indianapolis Colts history. With the AFC Championship being one, number one, <laughs> oh yeah, oh, uh, it was just exercising like so many demons with that particular win that it, it you just can't under, you just can't be it can't be understood it just can't be stated enough that to beat your is they were nemesis our nemesis at that point because well the year before we had beaten them but it was the playoffs it's like look man be sick and tired of being sick and tired and that was a uh, Tari Glenn said that and that just resonated. It's time. It is time to stand up to the bully, just and just start punching back. To win that game in that fashion with Bill Polian not winning one, Dungey not winning one, Manning not winning one, and people just saying that they can't win the big one. It just and uh, in the playoffs against the Patriots, uh, Belichick, Brady. It just it was just so much on the table, and then the, the two weeks later, winning in in the elements, the rain. So we answered so many questions in a two week span. And it kind of solidified our place in uh, NFL uh, uh, history. It really did. And it also solidified the Colts-Patriots rivalry because that's the best rivalry I've ever seen in my lifetime. Colts versus Patriots, Manning versus Brady, Dungy versus Belichick, big city, small city. It had everything you could possibly want in a rivalry. The Colts just hadn't won their playoff matchup yet, and the Colts hadn't won their Super Bowl yet. And that 06 game really, I think, solidified it as the rivalry and living up to the hype of it because it was Patriots, Patriots, Patriots up until that point. And then when you guys finally broke through with the Marlon Jackson interception, beating the Patriots, going to the Super Bowl, and then sealing the deal in Super Bowl 41, I think it really solidified what a rivalry it was. And in my opinion, it was the greatest rivalry of my lifetime, the greatest I've ever seen. Ooh, I mean, I would hate to sound like biased because you because let's remember, you can still have those Ravens, Steelers, Steelers. Cowboys, Giants, you know all these other robbers, but in my defense, man. in my defense, I don't, I wasn't really, I wasn't really around yet. So although I am probably biased towards the Colts, it's by far the best I've ever seen. Yeah, it was, it was some real life hatred, man, like, oh, yeah. <laughs> like some gang fight type stuff. We, it was just that <laughs> bad. So, <laughs> uh, but it was always that respect. Like we look at the schedule, we we know exactly when we're playing the Patriots, and yep. that is the game we must win if we want home field advantage. It was not even a question. Not to say, not to uh, 
take lightly the other teams, but it was the freaking Patriots. We got to beat these dudes, man. <laughs> when do you think that ended? At what point did the Colt Patriot rivalry stop being a rivalry? Because some people still think it's a rivalry, even though we haven't won in 11 years. Was no, there ever a point no, where in the locker a, no. room if that game didn't feel as special as it once did? Well, I'm, I'll keep it brutally honest. When uh, when Peyton left, mm-hmm. it just kind of it, it fizzed out because I mean, let's keep it real. It, they made it a whole a lot about Brady Manning type of deal, but it was still they never played each other on the field, you mm-hmm. know. But it was that whole. I mean, like you said, they, they're more they've become our nemesis again until we start whooping them yep. again so it's more of a nemesis versus a rivalry it's just just the hatred is it's deep seated so i don't think that's going to go anywhere anytime soon even with the kicking the tires of brady coming to indianapolis i just 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 could not under any circumstance see that <laughs> exactly you're right because when the two teams match up it doesn't have the same spark that it once had but at the same time i could not imagine tom brady being a Colt and putting the horseshoe on the side of his helmet, I feel like at that point we would just be upsetting the football gods. <laughs> uh, he's and my, you know, let me say this: he's a guy that you hate to love. Once you get to know him, he's like, damn, this dude is cool. Mm-hmm. But I don't want to like him, but he's 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 a cool guy. But mm-hmm. him being here, just like man, just the thought of him wearing a shoe, it kind of makes you want to throw up. <laughs> exactly. I mean, we've all seen the documentaries of Magic and Bird. They hated each other on the court. They loved each other off the court. USA teammates, Olympic teammates, dream team. But you could never see Larry Bird play for the Lakers. You could never see Magic no. play for the Celtics. It just couldn't happen. Yeah. And uh, I just don't think, you know, this day and age, just rivalries like that, I think they just kind of kind of faded, faded away, man. Because. Mm-hmm. I guess you you know you know where I'm going with this with the LeBron and the KDs and yeah, you know yeah. that type of stuff, but it is what it is, you know. Couldn't have said it any better. It is what it is. As we're talking to the Colts' all-time leader in sacks, Robert Mathis, here on the For the Culture podcast. And now, Rob, we're gonna play a little rapid fire with your favorite this or that in your career. Favorite game? My favorite. Oh, my favorite game. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, favorite game you've played as a Colts. Oh, uh, AFC Championship, 2006. <laughs> yep. <laughs> best teammate you ever had? The best teammate. Ooh. Oh, I got a, I have a few of them. I just can't. Uh, <laughs> you can list them. Freeney Wayne, Freeney Wayne, Bracket, uh, Kato Jones, <laughs> Antoine Bethea. That's my answer. I'm going with that. That's pretty good. We had two of your top five teammates on the For the Culture podcast for an interview. We had Reggie Wayne. And we had Cato June. Most underrated teammate you ever had? Antoine Bethea, uh, 100%. I totally, from the outside looking in, totally agree. I never thought Antoine Bethea. And what about the durability of Bethea? Still till this day, still playing. Yeah. I always still felt going. like he was one of the more underrated Colts. Hey, I, I, I 100% agree because uh, he, he kind of was the glue that held us together. Yep. And I can really identify you know, with this journey. Namely, being a small HBCU guy playing in the uh, shadows of uh, Bob, you know, I played in the shadows of Dwight. Just earning your seat at the table, not complaining, just going to work, and that's that's who he is. He's going to get the job done. Mm-hmm. Toughest offensive tackle you ever went against? Oh, uh, uh, Walter Jones, Walter Seattle Jones. Seahawks. What about the favorite? Your favorite tackle, the guy who you love to match up against? <laughs> oh. Uh, uh, went, uh, it was Winston from the Texans at the time. He was University of Florida, so he's not going to like the, that I gave the answer. But, yeah, it's, it's definitely him. Toughest loss of your career? Oh, Super Bowl 2009. Yeah. That was that, – that hurt. Where's the 05 loss to the Steelers rank? Is that – Second, third, number two, number two, number two. <laughs> yep. <But that's> two <laughs> as a fan, I would have to agree. Those would probably be one and two in my book as well. Yeah, that was yeah. That O five loss was 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 gross. Oh, the O five loss was brutal. But at least we bounced back the next year and we got revenge. The problem with losing to the Saints in the Super Bowl is that was kind of like the beginning of the end. We never were able to get back there. Absolutely, it was that 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 game. I <laughs> I still cannot. Look at that game. I have not seen that that game in its entirety, and probably won't. What about the team you hated the most? Patriots. No, that's not even. Did you even need to ask me that? <laughs> <laughs> we wanted the soundbite, Rob. We just wanted the soundbite. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> New England Patriots. 
up in Boston, Massachusetts, in the New England area. <laughs> oh, man. What about your current role with the organization as the pass rush consultant working with player development? How has that been for you going into your fourth season, and what does that entail? I'm a basically an independent contractor, and it's just an ideal situation. I still get to be around my team and uh, and do what I love doing best, and that's teaching pass rush. And but I also have my own training company. It's the Gridiron Gang with my with a good friend and an old teammate Dan, Daniel Muir. We train from grade school all the way up to the pros, and so and we up in uh, Westfield Grand Park, and it's just a uh, just a great situation. The, the the team they trust me enough first off to just continue helping to teach and, and guide and uh, uh, groom the younger guys. You know, Names like Kamoko Ture, uh, Taquan Lewis. Uh, you know these guys. We're still working with Justin Houston and these guys, Danico Autry as well. And uh, just, they really just latch on to uh, the stuff that I teach. And it's, it's just great. And I, I just love every, every, every part of this situation because it's, it's ideal for, for all parties involved. That is ideal. And I was curious because I've seen Kamoko post on Instagram videos and workouts from your facility but i've also seen you on the sideline with a headset on at colts game so i wasn't sure what the balance was between you doing your own thing and still being affiliated with the colts organization so that sounds like it's working out perfect for you and you're getting the best of both worlds you're still working for the colts you're still coaching and you're still running your own stuff on the side a win-win for both parties especially like with the headsets it's, it's i'm not saying anything it's just okay i get the calls Mm-hmm. So now I'm looking to see if, if they're doing it as they're trained to do and uh, as they was coached up to do. And if so, you know, pat on the back. If not, I'm going to coach them up. I'm going to jump them. And so kind of like the I can be a bad guy, but without minus all the yelling and cussing, it's just yeah. the guys really take to to the, my instruction. And so they just want to be – they want to be the best that they can be. And so and they're just willing to learn. You mentioned a couple of the younger pass rushers you've been working with at Gridiron Gang, like Kamoko Trey and Taekwon Lewis. Kamoko obviously coming back off that broken ankle from the Chief game last year. What is his ceiling? What do you see in Kamoko Ture, and what could we expect out of him this season? Oh, yeah. Well, one of my favorite things about being retired is that I don't have to back up my trash talk, so I can, I'm <laughs> going to talk a little trash, and I'm going to depend on him to back it up. Ture is going to be – He's going to be a sack champion in 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 a, in a year or two, and I think he's going. To, he has the he has the skill, the talent to uh, break that sack record. So I need I'm making it my business to get him get him there. So he's definitely a guy that he. If I say go run in the street and if, and and it'll get you get him a sack, he's he he trusts me enough that he'll do that. And I don't take that lightly. The fact that he's trusting me that much, and so. That's why I I last last you know kind of took to him, and he's he's a kid that he watch out for him. He's gonna come back and he's gonna come back in a, in a big way. We actually had Kamoko on the For the Culture podcast in November, and he had nothing but great things to say about you. And he said that you were one of the guys that helped Ballard scout him out of Rutgers and eventually go on to draft him in the second round of the 2018 draft. Yeah, that's when I was actually the assistant D line coach. So I'm doing, watching, doing film work. I said, "Oh, this this guy got some. Go get it, you know." Mm-hmm. And watching film, I'm, I'm a I'm a guy that look. I don't need to see combine numbers and forties and broad jump. Let me see the film. Yep. And he's whooping guys. He's beating guys on film. So that was, and the way he was winning, told me everything I need to know. This guy's a pass rusher. He just need. He just rough around the edges and just need. Need, need some grooming and sculpting, and so that's where we come in. Yeah, and he also got off to a late start because he told me he didn't start playing football until like his junior or senior year of high school, so he was very raw, but obviously extremely talented, and we saw flashes of it last year, and I can't wait to see him get back out there at 100% this upcoming season coming off the broken ankle. And Rob, as a coach now, when you look at a young pass rusher, like when you scouted Kamoko out of Rutgers. What are the three most important traits you look for when evaluating a young pass rusher? Uh, the three most important traits are planning your work, working your plan, and get off, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when I say planning your work. That's that's classroom talk. You're doing the scheme, the uh, scheme it up. Okay, so just plan, just planning your work as far as like doing your film work, doing uh, in practice. Uh, working your moves, knowing the little things 
the little minute details and and once you get to the game, I always tell the guys, look, if this works in practice against a guy that knows you, that you go against every day, like Ryan Dean, I used to go against him every day in practice. Mm -hmm. If the moves that I do work against him, it's going to work in a game versus a guy that does not know me. So trust your process, work your plan. And uh, the greatest equalizer in the art of pass rush is a great get off. Get off on the ball. <laughs> Man, the camp battles this year, Rob, are going to be insane. Especially, like, interior. I cannot wait to watch DeForest Buckner go up against Quentin Nelson. I think that camp this year is going to be really fun for you guys with the battle in the trenches on both sides, the offensive line and the defensive line. I think both units are going to be top five, respectively. And what do you see right now as the ceiling for this Colts defense? With the addition of DeForest Buckner and the addition of Xavier Rhodes, how good could this Colts defense be in 2020? This is how this is how much of an upside I feel our defense has. Uh, the oldest guy on, on the defense is, I want to say, Justin Houston, and he just well, he's thirty, thirty one. Mm -hmm. And the good part about that is that he's in his prime as a pass rusher. Pass rusher hit that prime late twenties, early thirties, and you surround him with a bunch of of young under twenty six studs. <laughs> so that's that's what I feel about this defense. Is they're young, fast, and hungry. So and and it's a lot of unfinished business that uh, that they that, that they have to uh, complete. Yep, I'm pumped up. I love this team. I love this defense on paper. I'm excited for the 2020 season. Everybody's asking, are we going to have a season? Are we not going to have a season? Is it going to get postponed? Is it going to get delayed? We don't know, but we really appreciate you taking time out of your day to be with us today, to distract us from all the negativity in the world with COVID-19, to take a trip down memory lane, and to catch us up to date with what you're currently doing for the Colts organization. So, Rob, we really appreciate it. God bless you and your family during this coronavirus pandemic. Hopefully it all goes away soon, and we have football in September. Go Colts, man. Everybody stay safe. Go Colts. That was the Colts' all-time leader in sacks, number 98, the great Robert Mathis, right here on the For the Culture Podcast.